Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone to the, this is the first episode um, of the Become Your Own Therapist podcast, uh, where I'll be exploring with professionals in the field, uh, the ways in which we can become our own therapists and the degree to which that is possible. Today, I have uh, Anthony Townsend. He's a qualified clinical psychologist and an accredited neuropsychologist running a busy private practice in Santon. Uh, he's been in private practice for the past 10 years. He's currently completing his PhD through UNISA. He attended the 10th and 11th annual neuroscience courses at Oxford University, hosted by the Nuffield Department of Neuroscience. He's worked in uh, several psychiatric and general hospitals all throughout South Africa. He's a member of the Medical Appeal Board of the South African Civil Aviation. He's a co-founder of Insight Now, which is SA's first virtual reality therapy venture and a guest lecturer and researcher for postgraduate courses for the Department of Psychology at the University of Pretoria. Um, Anthony, thanks so much for being here. It's my absolute pleasure, and what an honor to be the guest on the, on the inaugural episode. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, it, it, trust me, the honor, is, uh, the honor is all mine. So um, great, Anthony, I wanna, I wanna kick off with um, just you introducing the kind of therapy that you do um just and and you know it's it's totally for a lay audience so uh, the kind of therapy you do and uh, just how that works absolutely thanks man and of course I'll, I'll i'll try my best to keep it jargon free i'm usually bad at that but um, <laughs> but, um i'm gonna try and break it down essentially as as a therapist i think I, I work integratively as i think so many of us do meaning that i draw upon different therapeutic styles mm -hmm. and often blend different elements of them uh, because I guess there, there's very rarely a one-size-fits-all when it comes to the kind of work we're doing. So there are three predominant traditions that I tend to practice from. The major ones being cognitive behavioral therapy, psychoanalysis, and neuropsychotherapy. It's a whole bunch of big words, but basically broken down. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or as people will typically hear about it, CBT, just means that it's a style of therapy that focuses on cognition and behavior. So cognitive is obviously just a fancy German word for thinking. In behavior, we all know what that means. Therapy means adjustment. It's a style of therapy that helps you get a better sense of the way you're thinking about things that you might not always pay attention to, hmm. how you can adjust those thoughts, and how you can engage different behaviors to kind of get, a, get better outcomes in your life, have a more fulfilling relationship, get more success professionally, feel like you can achieve your goals better. So it tends to be a very practical, very structured, very goal-oriented way of working. Hmm. On the other hand, I also use something called psychoanalysis, which is what most people tend to think of and experience from therapy. It's a style of therapy that focuses on how early patterns in your life have influenced the formation of your personality and adulthood. And it's intended to kind of accomplish two goals. One, to deepen your insight about yourself, to help better understand who you are, how you developed and why you do some of the things you do, sometimes with the intention of showing you how you can do things differently. But usually the whole goal of how can you do it differently is more the realm of CBT. The other reason is of course to achieve catharsis or to gain emotional release. Sometimes we've got emotions that are bothering us and we don't fully understand them. And we're trying to get a sense of where they're coming from so that we can almost express and release some of this pent up emotion because we tend to feel a little bit better when we do that. And the final tradition I draw upon is something called neuropsychotherapy, which is really a lot to do with the normal ways we do therapy, just placing a biological slant on everything that we do. It gives you, gives you deeper insight, not only to what your emotions are and your behaviors are, but it uses a lot of data that we get from neuroscience to explain what's happening to us and how we can shift things from a biological perspective. So I tend to draw upon all these different modalities in trying to help people create changes or understand themselves better in the broader sense of the word. Man, Anthony, so many nuggets there. I, I think, um, you know, that was a really good job of being jargon free. I think there's a lot that people could, could pick out there. Um, so based, uh, based on all of that, you know, um, what then is the role of the therapist and to what degree can someone become their own therapist in, in line with the way that, you know, you think of, of how to help human beings? Yes, I think those are, they're both great questions. Um, and it's, it's interesting in the way that you're framing it, because I guess the way that at least I think of therapy, and I don't think I'm alone in this, 
is I think that the goal of therapy is ultimately to help someone become their own therapist. I, I often remark to people that I'm working with that I see my job ultimately is, is going to be well done if I make myself redundant. That, that's, that's what I think will be best. You know, I kind of, I want them to be rid of me and, and not have to see me if they really didn't have me. Yeah. But that's ultimately the best way of doing things, right? You know, I think that's been the mission of therapy for a long time. Uh, one of my one of my favorite quotes from Sigmund Freud is he said that he thinks that therapy is meant to be a science of freedom, mm. um, which I think is a lovely way of thinking about it. Mm. So if we're thinking about what do I see as the role of a therapist, I really see it as twofold. I think first and foremost, the role of a therapist is to have someone who not only has empathy and and personal strengths, but also has great insight into the scientific literature about humanity and their role predominantly is to help you make sense of yourself mm -hmm. so this is one of the things that we take for granted because you know we are actually very complex beings and mm -hmm. and as, as many will tell us because of because we we have this thing called consciousness consciousness is it's very difficult for it to master its own meaningfulness you know it's got so many different layers so many different facets that it's really difficult to make sense of in an easy fashion mm. and so sometimes we need someone on the other side someone with an external perspective to help us make sense of who we are what we're feeling why we feel that way and where that came from so really the predominant role of the therapist is to help you gain a better insight into yourself and your personality so that you can make sense of things not only for you, but for other people in your life. And the second role that I see is kind of an adjunct function of therapy is for the therapist, not only to help you understand yourself, but also usually in the context of therapy to isolate the things that you might be struggling with, sources of friction, points of suffering, problems, difficulties, issues, whatever you might want to call them, these things that you're not liking and show you alternative ways of being able to meet your needs that don't engender unnecessary suffering or can sometimes free you from old patterns that you've relied on without realizing it, to better meet your needs, have more fulfilling relationships and have greater emotional, I suppose, joy and contentment in your life. Hmm. So I'd really see it as your therapist's role is to help you understand yourself and make sense of things and then to be able to show you alternative ways of being in the world that can help you better get what it is you need. In terms mm. of how you become your own therapist, I mm. guess usually the route I would think of is go to therapy, learn what you need to, and then eventually you're probably going to get much better at being your own therapist. But I guess there would be a lot of other routes that you could mm. follow to be able to kind of get there, I guess. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, there's so much clarity in what you're saying. So, you know, the, the whole um, inside aspect, making sense of, of things for yourself and then, and then also the, um, learning new ways to be and and new things to do and especially in relation to what you're struggling with right so okay so in in, in terms of uh, you mentioned the scientific literature knowing the scientific literature about about human beings what do you think is in the scientific literature that actually doesn't hinge on uh, there being a therapist is there anything in the scientific literature that if people knew this or if people knew these sort of, you know, if they dabbled in these sorts of things, they would uh, be able to to uh, take on some of that responsibility of, of being their own therapist for themselves. Definitely. There's actually, if, if, if I think back, because I think it, it's a great mm. question, almost like what, what do people not know that psychologists get to read in scientific literature that, as mm. you say, would shed light on things to the point that they probably wouldn't need therapy? Mm. And there's probably, there's probably three major things that at least for me has come out of the literature that, that have been profoundly beneficial, that are, that are kind of the light bulb moments that I've experienced personally. And when I've shared them with people, it's kind of revolutionized things enough for them where they actually found that a lot of the work they would have otherwise done was no longer necessary. Mm. So I'd, I'd break them down into kind of these three categories. And, and, and sort mm. of the first one is probably the most important. A mm. big problem that people tend to have a problem with is this issue of motivation. Mm. So when we talk about motivation, it's not uncommon to hear someone say, I feel unmotivated or I don't have drive or I don't want to do things. And, and this is mm. kind of the common thing we all feel, right? We go, I know it would be really good for me to do this thing, 
I don't feel the motivation to do mm. this thing that I logically know I should be doing. And this is a horrible conflict that everybody has all the time, right? We have this with going to work, studying, exercising, eating healthy, let alone the complex things of, of doing the right things in our relationship, being a kind, considerate partner, doing the empathic thing. All of these things are like really effortful and arduous. And even though they, we know they have great outcomes, we don't have this feeling that wants to drive us. And then we go, I don't have motivation. And one of the things that kind of stood out to me in the, in the literature is when I started to dig deep in trying to understand motivation better, it, I actually learned something that, that kind of really blew my mind and helped me that I've shared with people, which is that we actually have a fundamental misunderstanding of what motivation means in the way we talk about it in everyday language. Hmm. So, for example, when, when I say to you motivation, like, I don't know about you, Niven, but for me, usually when I ask people, what do you mean when you say motivation? They often say to me, it's a feeling that I feel that will make me want to do something. <laughs> yeah. and, and like in fairness, that's how I was taught to think about it. You know, that's what mm. I thought the word meant. But if you dig into the neuroscience and you don't have to dig very deep, you'll actually discover that's not what motivation means. Mm. Motivation refers to the feeling you have after you do something, not how you feel before. So it actually comes from the Latin words to move towards and the French, mm. mo the French words for motion hence motivation. Mm. It's mm. a feeling you're chasing, not a feeling you already have. And so mm. the way we get taught to think about motivation is actually backwards. Mm. And when you, when you really think about it for a second, it actually makes more sense to think of motivation this way. It's a feeling you're going for, not a feeling you have. So if I say to you, Naverne, I, I, I don't feel motivated to study or I don't feel motivated mm. to exercise. So when I say to you, I don't feel motivated to, to study, I'm saying to you, Naverne, I don't have a feeling that I feel that makes me want to study. Mm. When you hear me say, me that, say that out loud, how many mm. people have you ever met that felt like studying that day? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or yeah. How, many times, how many times did you feel like studying mm. versus how many times did you study? How many times mm. did you actually feel like exercising where you're telling me you really, really, really wanted mm. to do that, right? Me too. I can't tell you how few times. I don't think I've ever felt like studying. I've studied my whole life. I'm still studying. Mm -hmm. I was never the time I felt like studying. There were times when I felt like learning something new, but doing an assignment, doing an exam, never, never felt like it. But I always did it. How? Mm -hmm. I found myself without realizing it, focusing on how I would feel after I do something rather mm -hmm. than how I would feel before. And I'm not just talking the long-term after. I'm not just saying once you get the degree or pass the exam and all of that stuff. I'm mm -hmm. talking right after you do this thing. Mm -hmm. What will make me study? How will I feel afterwards? Because mm -hmm. I'll feel less anxious. I'll feel more productive. I'll feel a positive mood state. And now when I do the stuff I actually want to do, I'm going to do it with less guilt. Mm -hmm. Now, if I learn to connect to how will I feel after and let that be the guiding force of my behaviors, two things mm -hmm. happen. Number one, it's very difficult for me to ba make bad decisions. Not to say that I don't. It's mm -hmm. just it's much more difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I no longer make this demand of myself to feel like doing things because it was never going to come in the first place. I always talk about it as that's a train that you're going to be waiting at the station forever because it's never going to arrive. You're never going to mm -hmm. feel like it because you weren't supposed to. And here you are demanding of yourself to master a feeling that was never going to exist because it couldn't exist before. If that feeling already existed, you wouldn't be engaging the action. So this whole idea is to come to understand you, you don't need to make yourself feel like doing something before you do it. Because mm. it's actually this really arduous demand that ties us in knots that don't need to exist. And that's a big mm. part of what stumbles us. We all go, I need to feel differently before I do something. Or I need to feel like it before I do it. And the truth is you never were going to. And if you learn that from the beginning, you stop putting pressure on yourself where it's kind of like every time I'm going to go exercise, um, I'll, I'll kind of without exception, we'll go like, okay, I have to go exercise. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll go, do I need to feel like it? And I'll smile. And I'm going, you weren't supposed to feel like it. Just go just drag yourself for five minutes. Once you're in it, you're in it. It's okay. And then afterwards I feel good. And I start reconnecting to the after feeling. It tends to be so much easier and half my problems get resolved. Now, usually when I share that with someone, like stop beating yourself up to feel like it before you do it or stop trying to make yourself do it. 
you can watch 10,000 Will Smith inspirational videos. They're not going to work. <laughs> you're still not going to feel like it. And you don't have to be kind mm. to yourself and realize you're not supposed to feel like it, but you'll feel really good afterwards. The mm. second you get reattached to that, it becomes this habit and this perspective. And it's so easy to get along with certain things that you need to do in your life. Because by sticking to the after effects, you have a truer emotional guide on things. Mm. So kind of the one big one is, is around motivation in that respect. Man, that's that's so powerful, Anthony. I, I think that that could have so much utility because it's a problem. It's a daily problem, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, if I were to generalize and, and assume that everyone's like me, man, this must be something that you run into quite often. And um, so I, I want to I want to then ask, like, uh, I, I know for me, like, for example, if I need to study or, or do something I don't want to do, there's usually like a frustration and you know, it's like, uh, you know, that uh, sort of feeling. And what, what would you say if we got a bit more granular? Um, what would you say to someone who in that moment, they need to do something they don't want to do? They just feel blocked, you know, emotionally congested. And in that moment, is it just the realization that they don't have to feel like doing it, uh, that alleviates that, that that helps, you know, helps them engage in the task? Is it just the, the, the realization? Or um, are there specific things that you could do in that moment to actualize this sort of uh, insight? It's a brilliant question, man. And, and, and the answer is twofold. So the first answer to it is yes. In some cases, the, the sort of the, the resolution to the feeling is, is almost this, this, this sort of equanimous acceptance of it where you're saying, mm. yeah, I, I'm not supposed to feel like doing this because often I've seen people do that when we talk about something that they were going to do. And I was like, so tell me, let's think about that. In what way were you going to feel like washing the dishes? What, what was going to generate excitement and enthusiasm? And, and, and like you and like me, they start laughing at that. Like mm. there was nothing, there was mm. nothing in the world that was going to yes. inspire me with this task. And just that moment of laughter is kind of important because mm. what we've learned from neuroscience is, what do we find funny? We find something funny when it's unexpected, but it's inconsequential. And we find it funny. We're laughing at ourselves because we're going, wow, I'm asking something really ridiculous. And now I feel relieved. I'm funny because I'm no longer frustrated and I'm no longer stressed about it. And it's cool because that's the thing. You don't have an issue doing the dishes, but you did have an issue making yourself feel like it. That's where your frustration was coming from because it's a rather menial task. And the second you embrace I don't have to feel like it. That's actually kind of liberating on the minor things. It's like, I wasn't supposed to feel like it. So the fact that it's annoying me is okay. I'm not such a weirdo. I'm not this horrible, lazy person because that's kind of what we do in our heads, right? And we think by castigating ourselves and telling ourselves how we suck, this is somehow going to propel us into action. And it's not. It's like, I'm not supposed to feel like it. It is kind of a dreary task. It's kind of funny that I thought I was going to be inspired. Nah, let me go ahead. So that works sometimes. Sometimes it's about realizing you don't have to feel like it. Just go ahead with it anyway, because it's not going to be so bad. It'll be over. Mm. But in some cases, it can be something that is actually a little bit more frustrating in the sense that it's a bit more long term. And there, there are two things that are important, because that takes mm. us into the territory of procrastination. Mm. One of the things that, that, that kind of links up with motivation a lot of the time is what the scientific literature tells us about procrastination, which I also thought was a cool way of thinking about it. For a long time, we thought commonsensically that procrastination is about avoiding a task. And it's actually not about avoiding a task. Procrastination is about avoiding a negative emotion. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, mm -hmm. you don't avoid tasks that don't create negative emotion. And usually things create mm -hmm. negative emotion when they're too long, they're too complex, or they're boring. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of trying to make certain things more fun or chunking them up, but you can't always do that. So sometimes what you have to be able to do, which is kind of wiring into the way our nervous system works, is when we have to do something we really don't like to do, we like to have a good reason for it. Hmm. So if you have to do something that's going to be long and complex and hard, you're going to be more okay with doing it if there's something good that's to follow, which is about learning to reward yourself. Now, I, I remember I once had someone who said, well, I don't want to be like Pavlov's you know, dog or Skinner's pigeon. I, I don't want to do this to myself. And I said, well, 
listen, no offense, but you are still an organism. So this kind of <laughs> brain work, you still have to do it. You, you have to give yourself the cheese at the end of the maze, I'm afraid, because we don't just run mazes. I certainly don't. I don't think you do because you're saying you want to work for free and not get your salary. It's probably not going to work, man. Mm. And you, you have to create these little rewards for yourself. And they don't have to be related to the mm. original task. So one of the things that happens is mastering motivation means don't ask yourself to feel like it now. Give yourself something to look forward to after you do it and reserve mm. it for that. Because now you're getting back to the after feeling. If the after feeling wasn't be, going to be good enough just by it being done, create an additional after feeling. That's nice. Give yourself the rewards at the end. Personally, I had to train myself this way. Mm. So it was, it was something that they sometimes called habit coupling. So, the, so there were two things that I used to, have to do, like exercise was a big challenge for me, even though it's a simplistic behavior. Obviously, there's more complex ways of doing it. But exercise was a big one for me. Like I, I, I exercise a lot, but I hate it. I really, really hate it. I loathe it. I don't want to do it. But I've conditioned myself to do it. And the way I initially had to do it was at the end of exercising, I had to do something that I really enjoyed. So there were certain podcasts that I really liked. And the thing was, I was only allowed to switch them on after I've got to the gym. The only time I'm allowed to listen to them is when I'm there. And the other thing I used to do was I really enjoyed these shakes from Kauai. I can't remember what they're called, but there's like a very specific thing. And I will only have that when I go to gym. And like just these little rewards just helped me get over the curve because I kept fixating on afterwards, 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 not before, before, before. And the second I allowed myself to drag myself to the after feeling, it helped me do it. So sometimes it is about just embracing the fact that it kind of sucked and laughing at it and carrying on. But other times, if you feel that's not getting you the whole way, create the additional small rewards at the end. And you'll be surprised that can actually take you further because it's all about staying in the after feeling rather than before. Hmm. Man, that's, uh, that's uh, again, I think that's so useful, Anthony. Um, if anyone is watching this on the treadmill, like you're on the treadmill right now at the gym, shout out to you. You've you know, done some habit, habit coupling without uh, realizing it. But uh, yeah, I mean, coming back to what you're saying, uh, the utility of that is, is just, I, I mean, my mind is going to so many places where this could be used. I, I can't think of a, you know, a domain in my life where I wouldn't be able to sort of use this uh, motivational hack to like, uh, you know, get me uh, get me to do the things that I find a bit difficult. So I think that's so valuable. Um, so what I'm hearing you say then is that part of, you know, part of becoming your own therapist could be uh, uh, managing, uh, well, just realizing that your, your behaviors aren't, con aren't contingent on the classical definition of motivation, which is that sort of impulse that desire to do something and that just that realization allows you to make more adjustments in your life which is how you define therapy right Adju adjustments exactly. okay exactly yeah okay and i mean it it, it kind of links up with with sort of the second of the three ones that i've kind of picked up on hmm. and the second one has to do i think again relating to emotion which is a lot of the time when we're talking about things, people will often say, I know logically that this might be right or this is irrational or this is the way things are, but I can't help this feeling. Like I, my feelings are telling me something different, this kind of constant head-heart conflict that we all experience mm. all of the time. Mm. And we often try and find a way of resolving it. And what I've noticed happens for us a lot is we try and resolve it by thinking our way through it. We think that we're going we're gonna to logic ourselves into mm. shifting our emotions. And to a degree, CBT endorses this, but only so far. Because of course, if you could logic your way through emotions, CBT would just be called CT. It would be just cognitive therapy, right? Mm. But it's not cognitive therapy, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's a big reason for it. What, often, what I've seen come from the empirical literature that really helps people in their everyday lives is to know that thoughts are logical, emotions are empirical. So what that means is emotions don't shift through thoughts, through logic, through reassurance. Emotions shift through one thing and one thing only, proof or evidence. So your, your logical brain says, explain it to me. Your emotional brain says, show me. Mm. And why that's important is because a lot of the time we ask ourselves to shift our emotions 
based on ideas, not based on experiences. And the only thing that can help us feel differently and change our emotions is to have different experiences, which is why cognitive behavioral therapy evolved to have behavior in. So for example, the way we often think about phobias is we go, say I'm afraid of spiders. And they'll say, okay, well, how am I gonna stop being afraid of spiders? Sometimes we might trap ourselves and think, well, I've got, to, I've got to logic myself into thinking spiders are safe. And that can help to a degree, but if I put you in a room with a spider and, and you're, still, you're gonna get scared. If you're afraid of the dark, I can tell you all the reasons not to be fearful of the dark. When I put you in a dark room, you're gonna be terrified. How are we gonna get you less afraid of something? Now that really matters because of course we can think of it in phobias, but you can also think of that in basic things like confidence. How am I gonna build my confidence? What can I tell myself to make myself confident? What can I learn or read to make myself confident? How can I feel confident for my new job? And the whole idea is that you can't create an emotion without experience. So how am I gonna get you to be afraid, uh, less afraid of spiders? We're gonna to have to spend some time with spiders. You need to see that when, I, when we put your hand in the bucket with the spider that you can clearly see, when you see that it doesn't bite you, that everything's okay, then you're going to be less afraid. Why? Because the logical centers in your brain knew you'd be okay, but the emotional centers can't come to that conclusion until they've got proof. You've got to prove it. You've got to see it to be true. I need you to sit in the dark room and see that you survive and nothing bad happens because then and only then will your emotional centers come into gross. So the same applies with confidence. How will I become more confident? You've got to have some experiences that show you're going to be okay. So some people will ask themselves before they start a new job, how can I be confident before I start my new job? And my answer is almost, that's the neat part. You can't. You can't be <laughs> confident in it because you haven't got any experience or proof to show you you're going to be okay. Mm. It's totally understandable and normal that you're not confident and you're, you're anxious. You're going to be confident six months into new, your, your new job mm. after you've had repeated emotional experiences that prove to you this is okay. Mm. And this really matters because when you understand that emotions are about experience and proof, you stop making a demand on yourself that's kind of an impossible one. We ask ourselves to shift our emotions based on thoughts rather than experiences and then we get upset with ourselves when our emotions aren't playing ball. But it's because we're not speaking the right language. And that's huge because that's how you overcome a lot of emotional difficulties. How do we become less anxious? Ultimately, we have to approach situations that we fear to see that we can actually handle them better than we thought. Not to say that you don't have a whole bunch of tools and perspective and support in doing it. But the ultimate resolution is that you have to confront those things to see that you get the experiences that tell you that you can do this. And I often think that when someone learns that, when you learn your emotions are only going to change when you have the right experiences, they usually find that they're less reliant on someone else and they feel like they're equipped for something because they're now allowed, allowing themselves to get the proof, prove it, prove it, prove it. And they start to find that their emotions become a lot more workable and pliable rather than feeling victim to them. Hmm. I see. I mean, you know, that's, this sounds like a lot of bad news, probably to some people, you know, the fact that they're going to have to put their hands in the spot. I'm sure some people unsubscribed um, at that point, <laughs> but I want to, I want to know, this makes me wonder what happens, why does it sometimes happen then that you, you do put yourself in a situation, like you confront your fear, so to speak, and you put yourself in the situation and you, you sort of grit your teeth through it and, and you, you tense your way through the whole experience. And then when you leave, you don't feel, you know, any better for it. Sometimes you even feel a bit more anxious. I think about like some people I've worked with who have social anxiety, for example, and they put them, you know, they're like, today I'm going to try, they get into a social environment and man, it's so uncomfortable. They leave and then, you know, what, what, what happens there and how could they have transformed that into something that sounds like what you were speaking about? It's, it's, it's really, really helpful to consider this because what you're talking about is very much the case for some people. So the real mm. fundamental difference is, is that when we do what you, I guess what CBT people would call exposure therapies, right? Like mm. you, you've got to be exposed to this thing. It can, absolutely, it can actually make things worse. The central condition is the following. Do I freely and willingly choose to go here because there's a good reason for it? 
So in, in neuropsychotherapy, they call this the difference between controlled and uncontrolled incongruence. Mm. Because emotional learning very much requires you to feel like you're in control. So mm. it's a good example of someone who's socially anxious. If I asked someone who's socially anxious, you know, I could just so flippantly say, cool, go put yourself in a social situation and, and just push through it, just push through it. Unless they've got a massively good reason to be in that particular social situation because there's something they really want from it. And unless they have felt that they are freely choosing it because they feel adequately supported, maybe through a couple tools that we would work on in therapy, mm. you're right. They won't get much out of it. They'll actually just feel terrible. I worked with someone in exactly that respect. And I remember there were times when we talked about it and, and he would say, like, I get what this means, but I'm struggling with this. And I said, well, almost think of it this way. I don't want you to socialize unless it was something that was really going to be meaningful to you, where you can see real purpose in this, because if it doesn't, mm -hmm. it will, it'll actually just be a terrible experience. Where is a place where you really want to socialize? And he actually talked about, about a particular girl and a particular friend that he really wanted to connect with more because he'd had good experiences with them. And what he would get from that felt worth the struggle. Mm -hmm. It felt like it meant enough to him that he would do it. And we talked about a couple skills, some structures, and we had, the, we had a couple things that were important, right? So we said, I want you to go and I want you to put yourself in this situation, but here's my commitment to you. Am I saying to you that under no circumstances can you leave? I'm not saying that to you. I want you to go and I want you to see how long you can last and you can leave anytime you want. No one should force you. I'm not going to force you. They shouldn't force you and you shouldn't force yourself. You should see how far you can get and be kind to yourself. Because if we do this whole thing, I'm slamming the door behind you, man, mm -hmm. this is going to be horrible. This is going to be terrible. And like you said, they're going to grip their teeth and you're going to come of it even worse, actually. Mm -hmm. It's almost that you've got to feel in control of the situation. You've got to feel like you can tell me, Anthony, I want to stop anytime I want, and you can. So we had that agreement where I said, I want you to go. And even if you only spend five seconds there, it's cool. Mm -hmm. If you want to come back, that's okay. You're not going to force yourself. Go for a little while and see how long you last. And you know in your head you can leave and you can take breaks. And the second we did that, where he felt totally in control of the situation and well supported, he actually got more out of himself than he thought. Like he, he subsequent to the thing, because he went to go meet with them, he went to this party, he ended up staying the whole night really long, and then he ended up seeing them again the next day. Wow. And he said he was, he was thrilled to report but the next day he was way less anxious than the evening before. Mm. Why? Because he got his emotional confirmation. You know, when mm. we're socially anxious, we think we're going to get this negative response from people. And he pushed through that feeling in a controlled way. And he saw that they really liked him. And of course they did. He was a really, really nice guy. There wasn't, there was, there was so much to like about him. But when he got that emotional confirmation, the next day, he no longer dreaded this because he already had proof that this is going to be okay. And, and he'd kind of overcome that anxiety and he was able to draw on that in other experiences. But he had said to me, he suspected he was only going to last five minutes. He didn't think he was going to be there very long. But the key difference was he knew he could back out and he could control it anytime he wants. So at least from what I've read in the literature and my experience in the burn has been the gritting your teeth and bearing it. Nah, that's definitely not the way we'd want to do it. Almost find something that means something to you and know that you get to be in control the whole way because the second you know that you're behind the steering wheel and you are allowed to go as far as you like it tends to have way more benefit to do this <laughs> that's i mean that's so useful so create uh, create put put the fear into a bigger context of of meaning and purpose for yourself um, and and a bigger vision that you have like just contextualize that fear within that and then make sure that the willingness is there hey and the aut autonomy what exactly is there anything that you would add to that for someone let's say you know someone's listening to this and they're in they're feeling a bit inspired to confront some sort of fear and they know that they need this bigger context of meaning and they need the willingness is there any other advice you would give them to to sort of do this on their own you know if they couldn't afford therapy or they didn't you know they didn't have a therapist with them definitely i would i would kind of give the two pieces because as we've said it's almost Decide the challenge you're going to give yourself because everything's going to be uncomfortable. But the only way you can make that discomfort count is based on what you see as the meaning. And that's going to be your end goal. Mm. The second thing is to know, put yourself in a position where you're in control. So we've got those two ingredients. But the third ingredient is probably the most important. And it's this kind of undercurrent that's in therapy that's really important that gets underrated sometimes. 
So in answering the question, there were, there's a really famous psychologist named Irving Yalom, who I really enjoy reading. Mm -hmm. And he explains in his version of therapy, he says the relationship is the most important thing. And, and the reason he did this was he once audited himself and he called a bunch of people that he'd worked with for a long time, like after a few years. And he asked them, what do you remember from therapy? And not one of them could remember any of the clever stuff that he'd said to them. Like the, none of them remembered that they didn't remember. But what they all said to him was they remembered the feeling they had with him. They remembered this connection that they shared with him. And that was huge for them. So the final ingredient that I would say to somebody that they need, and you don't need to only get this from a therapist, you're assured of it through a therapist, mm. but you need to have at least one supportive relationship where you're mm. connecting with someone about this, where they're not policing you, they're not so much holding you accountable, it's just that they're there to encourage you when you need it. Because while we all want to be totally emotionally self-sufficient, we are still pretty social, we're always interconnected. And it's nice to have someone who's just there where you're saying, this is something I'm working on and feeling like they've got your back in it. it makes a big mm -hmm. difference because they'll never fight you about it. They're not going to like, you know, police you, but they will help structure things and, and give you a sense of support because usually when we have that, it becomes a little bit easier to feel like we can navigate. Mm -hmm. Again, I, you know, I, the first, the first aspect that we spoke about the motivational aspect, I was, you know, speaking about how useful that could be uh, because of the prevalence of it, you know, these, mm. these issues. But I mean, a, uh, a way, a useful way to deal with the fear, that seems to me just as valuable. So uh, I, I can't think of anyone who doesn't have some sort of fear or, or specific phobia to something. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm keen to hear the, the third box. Absolutely. Well, the third one's kind of more broad ended and it comes from psychoanalysis, but I think it's really important because I find this to probably be the most useful and important thing, especially in the 21st century, in terms of the way people have been taught to think about their emotional lives. One of the, one of the sort of friction points I see people experience in themselves and one of their confusions that often gets clarified in therapy is to understand the nature of emotions. So we've talked a little bit about them being after effects and being empirical, but one of the kind of unfortunate things that I think psychology and psychiatry have been a little bit guilty of, even though we're trying to remedy that these days, mm -hmm. is we've unfortunately kind of pathologized emotions for people. And one of the things that I think is very important for people to be able to use to be their own therapists is to learn to depathologize their emotions. So one of the good examples of this is one we've been talking about. So a lot of people I meet when they talk about anxiety, it's almost like they've been taught to think of anxiety as a disease. Like if you have anxiety, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And I often smile and I go, anxiety is not a disease. Anxiety is an emotion. I've got anxiety. You've got anxiety. Your mother's got anxiety. Your son's got anxiety. Your friend's got anxiety. Your receptionist's got anxiety. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got anxiety. It's not a disease. It's an emotion. And why that's important is because when we think of things like anxiety and even to a degree depression, when we think of them as, as diseases, we think that there's something wrong with us for feeling these things. And then we think what we're supposed to do is switch the feeling off. And the problem is when you try and switch off a feeling, you're going to run into new complications and problems. So the way I often explain it is that anxiety isn't a disease. An anxiety disorder isn't about the presence of anxiety. It's about the absence of coping. So mm. it's, it's not bad that you're feeling anxious. Mm. It, you've probably got a good reason for it. It's that you don't know what to do with the anxiety. You've got a disorder. You don't know how to bring order and control to this emotion. You don't know how to manage it. And that's what we've got to help you with. So rather than thinking there's something wrong with you or you're ill, it's more about saying, okay, I've got this emotional experience that I need to decode and I need to work with. And the same for depression. So why that becomes important is the way we can almost think about it then is that we've got to change the way we think about emotions. Is The first thing is that emotions are not unlike other sensations we experience. So we've got two layers of needs as beings. We've got basic needs and we've got complex needs. So the basic needs are really easy to us. And if you start treating your complex needs like your basic needs, your life gets a lot simpler. So your basic needs are things like hunger, thirst, uh, breathing, sex, sleep, elimination functions. Those are some of the basic mm. needs. If we use hunger, that's an easy example. So imagine the following. Imagine every time you got hungry, 
which is an unpleasant sensation. It's not nice to be hungry. Imagine every time you got hungry, you told yourself there's something wrong with you. And then you said, oh, there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be feeling this horrible, uncomfortable feeling, right? Like we all smile because we're like, well, that would be weird. Could you switch that, in, could you switch that, that unset, unpleasant sensation off? Yeah, you could. You could take appetite suppressants. But you're probably going to get a whole bunch of new problems because that unpleasant sensation exists in you. That horrible feeling is there to tell you that you've got an unmet need, something mm -hmm. you need isn't happening hmm. so what so with hunger it's nice and simple that's why it's a basic need if i'm hungry i need to eat because if i eat the hunger goes away because i met my need for food same hmm. with thirst same with sleep so these are easy anxiety and depression are emotions that work the same way when you're anxious you have a negative feeling that's telling you about an unmet need because our emotions aren't pathologies. They're a complex information processing system. When you're anxious, what anxiety is about is anxiety activates any time you have an uncertain, uncontrollable future. You don't feel safe in some way. So your need is safety. And when you don't feel safe, you get anxious. So instead of switching the emotion off through like say a benzodiazepine or tr drinking the emotion away or something like that, Rather listen to the emotion and figure out what the need is. In what way don't I feel safe? Now, it's a complex need because we could feel safe, unsafe in a lot of ways. But if you took enough time to say, in what way do I feel unsafe? And you gave yourself some time to think, you might actually kind of nail on something, which is often what happens. You know, I, I find that if I give someone a, a room to think as a therapist, if I just kind of direct it ever so slightly, they get to the answer much faster than I would uh, because they know themselves. And they catch on this thing and they go, I feel unsafe in this way. And then we go, okay, cool. So in what way could you make yourself more safe? Say it's social anxiety. Maybe one of the ways you'd make yourself safe is, as you say, maybe we'd avoid. Okay, if that's really what's going to work. What's another way to make yourself safe? Let me find someone who I already feel safe with and connect with them in that situation because then I can stay here but feel safe. Or maybe let me make myself vulnerable with someone, even though that's scary, to see if I get acceptance and then I can connect with them further. There's like a whole bunch of strategies mm -hmm. that you could probably figure out, as we often do, because we're very adaptable. We just don't give ourselves credit for it, that we might use to do that. But the same can apply for depression. You know, someone will say, I'm depressed, therefore there's something wrong with me. And we'll say, well, well what's depression about? Well, depression is an emotional reaction to loss. You know, that loss can take a lot of shapes. You could lose a relationship, a job, a treasured future, a version of yourself, uh, a meaningful part of leisure. You could lose a whole bunch of different things, but when we lose mm -hmm. something, we feel depressed. So instead of trying to switch the feeling off, what if we took some time to understand it as reflecting a need and go, what have I lost? What's missing? Because if we can figure what that out is, you know what your behavior is to recultivate a connection to certain things. Now, there are such things as irrevocable losses, and then we have to mourn it. But there are also losses where you can reconnect. So one of the ways we can become our own therapist is to realize your emotions are not pathologies. Your emotions are actually signals to tell you about needs. And you can learn to decode them a little bit better, sometimes with the help of someone else, but sometimes with yourself and sometimes through reading and sometimes through listening to things. But if you started treating your emotions as a signal to yourself, you'd come to notice they're not enemies. They're just really irritating friends. Um, they're, those, they're those friends that won't give up on you, that will bug you about this. But if you started to listen to them in terms of indicators of needs, you might actually have a better relationship with yourself and learn how to treat yourself a little bit better. And even though you'll fumble and you'll miss, every time you hit the wrong target, it's going to help you get closer to the right one. And you could learn a lot more about yourself this way rather than fighting emotions. I love that uh, uh, imagery of the irritating friends, you know, just constantly pestering you out of good, good intent. Exactly. Uh, and, and something I find myself um, helping clients with in terms of the emotional world is helping them just see that these things that feel quite negative can actually have lots of good intent for them. And they can be signaling things that are in the best interest of, of that person. And so it sounds like becoming your own therapist involves not putting these negative feelings in the, in the naughty corner, but actually just, actually just listening 
listening to them, lending an ear to to what they have to say. So, Anthony, how would you, for someone who is trying to to understand um, what these emotions are saying, but they find it a bit difficult. To them, it's this vague unpleasantness or this, you know, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. Uh, how how could someone like that um, navigate this world that they don't even seem to to understand? No, I, I think it's a very important thing to kind of consider. So if we look at it, you know, therapists have to navigate it in the same way. And while we might have certain pieces of knowledge, a big part of therapy is curiosity. You know, a therapist is quite willing to go, I don't know the answer beforehand, but I'm quite willing to help you do it. And it's about asking the right questions. Now, you only learn how to ask the right questions of somebody else or yourself by first just asking questions. And so the best way of facilitating reflection and getting better understandings of yourself is to ask questions. So for instance, a lot of the time we all have this knee jerk response and, and I am guilty of it too. Um, and sometimes I'll tease people that I work with where I'll kind of playfully say, I don't know if you noticed this, but before you gave yourself 0.2 seconds to think about that question, you immediately jump to, I don't know. And then they'll <laughs> smile and go, I did do that. And, and I do it too. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when something feels uncomfortable, we don't want to think about it. But the truth mm -hmm. is, if we don't think about it, we're going to keep feeling that way. If we think about it, we might hit on what's going on, and then we can meet our need, and then we feel a lot better. It's kind of like when we're really hungry, and then we're starting to get angry and upset and difficult and irritable. If we keep ignoring the feeling, it's not going to go away. It's just going to get worse. So mm -hmm. we may as well deal with it sooner. So where would you start? you'd notice the feeling and you've got to ask yourself the question, what am I actually feeling right now? Like what I feel, do, would I call this angry? Would I call this anxious? Would I call this sad? And it's important to understand that those things mean different things to different people. It's not so easy to just say, this is exactly what anxiety feels because everyone's got their own variability. Maybe some people have sort of commonalities, but ask yourself, what are you feeling? And be kind to yourself because you are still the expert on yourself. You will still kind of figure out a little bit about it. But you go, what am I feeling? The biggest question to ask yourself as a starting point is, when did I start feeling this way? Because that's the thing. It's not random. It, it doesn't mean it's going to be pinpoint obvious, but generally you'll notice something. So I might say to someone, when, when did you start feeling like sad and depressed? Mm -hmm. And like I had that conversation with someone recently where, where, she, where she was saying, I've been depressed and I've been feeling awful and I hate it. And she was getting so stuck in the feeling. And I said, look, it is awful. I'm sorry that it's been feeling like this. When did this happen? Like, when did you start feeling this way, roughly? And she first said, I don't know. And then we joked. And then she caught herself and she said, okay, let me think. It's like, I don't know. It's been, I guess, like about six months. I said, okay. Well, tell me, I mean, from what you can remember, what was going on six months ago? And immediately she smiled and she started rattling off. She's like, I broke up with my boyfriend. I learned that I couldn't go to the university I wanted to, to study my master's degree. And I found that my job started getting really unfulfilling because I got took, taken up a project that I didn't like. And I mean, I think you're, you're thinking exactly what I'm yeah. thinking. How many times has that happened to us, right? Like, and mm. I've had that where someone asked me just that question of when did you start feeling this way and what was going on in your life at the time? And then I also, I'll also exhale and I'll go, oh man. And she also did that. She exhaled and she said, Wow, and the tears welled up and she cried for a little while so she could just get that release because it just mm -hmm. made sense in her head for finally. And of course she realized she's like, geez, I'm I'm not, there's not something wrong with me. Like those were really painful things that happened to me, you know? But that tells me a lot. I've been feeling down because I don't feel as connected, you know, and I, I something stumbled with me. And then we had to say, okay, so this is when it started. So what are you feeling? when did you start feeling this way and what was happening around that time and usually what we always need to remember is it's very rarely one thing it's like usually a couple things but just when you start to do that you'll notice certain patterns and the good thing is the question is how do you know your answer was right because you'll feel it the second you pinpoint what the emotion was and you say the right thing the emotion gets stronger it's almost like telling you you've hit the pain point and that's how you know you're right so that's kind of what you get taught as a therapist. You get taught, you can fo forward all these fancy interpretations of someone's life. How will you know they're right? Because the emotion will pour out. Because mm -hmm. the, if, if the emotion didn't pour out, you weren't on track. 
it, it wasn't hitting here. Um, and that was really important because when she saw that, she went, oh, and then before I could even say anything, she was being her own therapist. She's like, I know what I need to do. <laughs> and she was right. She's like, okay, I don't need to go on dates right now, but I definitely need to connect with my friends because I've been feeling kind of lonely. So I need mm -hmm. to go spend some time with people. And then when I'm ready, I'll start dating. I couldn't go to that university. I've got to look at alternatives. And this job, it sucks. I've got to go talk to my boss. I've got to get something more interesting to do while I'm there. And that was that. Like she already started to kind of generate these beautiful solutions for herself before I needed to say anything. And that was, you know, really a remark on her expertise and her resilience about her own emotional world. So in the burn for me, it would be about asking questions, but asking questions like, what do I feel? What, where, did this, where did this start? And what was going on at the time? Because sometimes it's going to be a long time and sometimes it's going to be a short time. But it's, it's quite convenient how quickly you can start tracing that trajectory. And if you can't come to an answer for yourself, it's good to talk to someone. It doesn't have to be a therapist. Just bouncing off those ideas mm. because usually you find that you'll dig a little bit deeper. Hmm. I see. So you're almost like a, you keep throwing some, some uh, you know, lines into the water and then seeing if, if anything gets caught almost. So you, using, using the, the logical, that sort of heady part of you, but then ultimately relying on the emotion as the gauge for how spot on that is. And, and to me, that seems like a, a great way to avoid that, that problem that you spoke about earlier, which was the trying to logic the emotions. Cause I, you know, I, I see how that um, relying on the emotion as the gauge, it, it sort of provides some integration in a way. That's, that's what I'm getting from this. Definitely. And, and, mm. and I, I like your metaphor of throwing the lines in because you don't know where the fish are going to be. You don't know when there's going to be a bite, right? <laughs> but you've just got to throw it in. And, and even Freud, he didn't use these words, but basically he said free association and therapy is a way of stupidly guessing at what's going on because you'll be surprised how quickly you end up at the right answer mm. when you do. Mm. I love that so, uh, because I, I think a lot of people probably either they don't start stupidly guessing like they don't take they don't venture out or they might stupidly guess but get stuck in a carousel of stupidly guessing because there's no a sort of emotional gauge there to to indicate when they might be on track so i think there's a lot of uh, a lot of value there i uh man anthony there's i think any one of these things that you've spoken about is probably enough to to really pivot someone in in a different direction in terms of their their life trajectory so uh feeling really grateful for the way that you conceptualize these things and the way that you communicate it uh i want to i, I want to ask you know just as a sort of like a, a closing question just based on on all of this wisdom that you've thrown out so far um, and all of these doorways that people can walk through if someone were to decide today, you know, today I, I'm going to start to take this a bit seriously, becoming my own therapist, and I'm going to try and help myself and make an earnest effort at it. What would be a good um, starting point? And you can link it to things you've said, or you can, you know, run wherever your mind takes you. Definitely. I, I, I think for me, when I think about that project of where would I start, there's, there's sort of three broad areas that I think are the, probably the most important. So probably the most powerful and important one is I think the best way of becoming your own therapist requires you to get to know yourself and to get to know yourself. It requires of you to engage new experiences. So you have to decide not only on what your goals are, because of course, if you don't have a blueprint, you can't go anywhere, but you've got to almost challenge yourself to how to get there. So I think step one to becoming your own therapist is doing what therapists do, which is where they'll say to you, what is it that you want? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to get out of therapy? Where do you want to go? Mm. So ask yourself that question. And you do not have to have the most specific answer in the world, but you'll have a broad question. Once you do that, you've got to say, okay, what is it that I want? Map it out for yourself. And then you've got to say, okay, cool. How do I get there? Now, part of how you're going to get there is these three routes. Number one is have new experiences. If you want to experience new sides of yourself or learn more about yourself, you have to put yourself in situations that are going to show you to yourself in a new light. Mm. So that's kind of why people go for the hike or they go try the part three class or they go do this other thing or they go hang out with this person that they don't know as well because it's almost like I don't know what to expect and I'm going to learn new things about myself. 
So you go and you have new experiences. The second one is really important. The most effective means by which we can begin to understand ourselves that we get from therapy, that we don't have to get from therapy, is through a process of feedback. It's not often enough that we ask the people around us in a sincere fashion to give us feedback about ourselves, to say to someone, listen, I'm actually kind of growing. I'm trying to work on myself. I'm trying to learn new things about myself. So you can share what you feel comfortable, even if you want to do it anonymously, but I'd like to hear kind of some thoughts you might have on me, you know, as a person on things I do, on strengths, on vulnerabilities, on things you think I could work on. And you only do this with the people you really trust and you do it from a place of curiosity and sincerity because we usually don't get this feedback and we don't ask for it. So people don't know. So seek out feedback from people in your life that you trust, who know you well, because they're going to help you spot some things. Some of it's going to reaffirm your sense of yourself and some of it's going to help you learn about new things, which will help because that's usually what therapy is about. And the last one, of course, is to expose yourself to as much information as you can. So that information can include reading, podcasts, YouTube videos, anything. The only guideline that I'd have is how do you screen sort of the, the, the nonsense and the, and the snake oil sales from the science is look at the credibility of the people offering it. I do recommend rather stick to established neuroscientists, psychotherapists, those sorts of people, because they, they have to have an empirical and, and I suppose background, and they have to have an, an accreditation. Usually accredited people are more reliable and it's worth following their advice. You know, there's some really wonderful people out there like yourself offering these really beautiful guidelines to people from a really scientific sound base with a lot of compassion that I think can be helpful. And I think if you line those things up with what you're trying to accomplish in terms of having set goals, I think you've got a really nice starter kit for being your own therapist. Mm. Great. So that's, that's such a, that's such a useful summary. Have, have new experiences, um, expose yourself to, to lots of information. I, Anthony, how, how can people get in, in touch with you um, about, you know, learn more about what you do and your work? Sure. So I, I have a website, anthonytownsend.com. So easy enough to remember, it's just my name with .com at the end. And it's got a little bit about me and the different things that I do and ways of reaching me. Um, but, but you also, if you just Google Anthony Townsend psychologist, you'll be able to see a lot of podcasts that I've been on or, or media appearances I've made. And you'll also get access to a lot of my academic literature and things that I've published. And those are usually easy and convenient ways of, of getting in touch with me. Okay, perfect. I mean, I'd, I'd definitely recommend uh, whoever's watching this, uh, to just, uh, check Anthony out. Anthony has had a, a personal influence in my career and he's lectured me as well. So um you know a lot of praise for you and a lot of uh, appreciation for coming in today uh thanks so much anthony then it was a great pleasure thank you so much for having me okay great